Hello, everybody, and welcome in to another episode of the Couch GM's Podcast. It is Friday, February 4th, 2022, and I'm your host, George Kurth, here joined by Cody Roadcap. Cody, how you doing on this fine February morning? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. A little disappointed that after all the alternates were named, I was not named to the Pro Bowl, uh, but I still get to hang out with you, so it's a good day. <laughs> we'll make our own Couch GM's Pro Bowl Maybe we'll invite a couple people who are performing well in playoff challenge or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. (laughs) But anyway, today we're covering on the show. We're going to talk some NFL news and notes. We're going to give some quotes of the week, and we're going to do a way too early mock draft here to fill in our fun Pro Bowl week in the NFL. It was requested by Brandon. I know Brandon has uh, been skeptical of some stuff we've said on the show before or uh, complained because we've trash talk him and he says he doesn't get to talk back, but was a great idea we thought it's something we throw into the show for you all here on this week of a game that we don't normally watch Um, but make sure you find us all on the couchgms.com and our social media channels to get more than you get just from the show here itself cody i know there's some big stuff in nfl news why don't we jump right in let's do it Well, we started off in NFL news with something that we had talked about a little bit last week, but is now official. Um, I think we should probably talk about the roller coaster ride that came to it, too. And that is the retirement of one Tom Brady. Uh, It started off with Adam Schefter tweeting that he Tom Brady had decided to retire Tom Brady's. um, Was it nonprofit or what or what was it that uh, also tweeted out that he was retiring? And then his company, TV 12. Yeah, that's what it was. Um tweeted out that he was retiring as well and a congratulations and all of a sudden they pulled their tweet and they said tom brady has not made his final decision we're not going to speak on him he is going to make the decision himself he eventually did a few days later come out and officially retire on his instagram account so cody what are your thoughts from the roller coaster that happened here and final thoughts on his career as we move to the next page of the nfl's history book I think you, that last line, I mean, wraps it up. We're moving on from the next page of the NFL and the history book. I mean, he was a quarterback for 22 years. It's crazy to think how long he has been playing at the high level he's been playing at. I mean, he's going to retire. I know he's not going to retire a Super Bowl champion. He's going to be one year removed, but he is going to retire leading the NFL in passing yards at 44 years old. I know he often said he wanted to play to his 45. He didn't quite make it. I know Giselle... And his family, I think he, you know, started to want to be there for his kids a little bit more. Definitely weighed big on this situation. Uh, So props to him. Congrats on a huge career. Definitely the most accomplished quarterback of all time. And I do have to say, I did hear on Twitter. Now, this is Twitter sourcing. So take it with a grain of salt, as you should always do when you hear things on Twitter. But it appears that the whole uh, roller coaster was because... Tom Brady was in talks with some people at ESPN about doing a retirement special to announce his retirement, but it got leaked that he was going to retire and that's how it broke. But he wanted to be the guy to say what he was doing. So that is how the, that's why there was the recall. Give it a couple of days. He makes the official announcement again. That is just tri- Twitter speculation. So take it with a grain of salt, uh, but definitely seems like something that could have happened. It could have, especially because, like we said, Adam Schefter, I believe, was the first source to leak the Tom Brady retirement announcement, and he is the lead NFL writer for ESPN. That would make sense. But I don't know. It it, it really is. I think I did actually do a good job of saying it's, an, it's a change in the you know page in the history book of the NFL because he's been around for so long. He is the most decorated quarterback in NFL history. And as people that grew up in like Cody and I's generation of football, He's one of the prominent quarterbacks. So like that whole entire list of prominent quarterbacks now that we were growing up on are pretty much gone. Like you can even argue like the last one left would be Aaron Rodgers, but he didn't start actually starting as a starting quarterback until I believe 2008. So right. I was watching I was watching NFL football for at least four or five years before that. He's not even technically in that first crop of quarterbacks. But now that you had Tom Brady gone, Ben Roethlisberger as well this year you really are going into a whole new era. And these quarterbacks that are starting to come up, like the Joe Burrow, the Josh Allen, the Patrick Mahomes, are really now stepping into the spotlight as the prominent quarterbacks, and they're now veteran quarterbacks. 
in the NFL, not just the young guns trying to take over. Yeah, you, you made a great point, you know, with Aaron Rodgers. He he didn't start till 28. I mean, he was drafted the year after Big Ben, Phillip Rivers, Eli Manning. But those three years, it feels like an eternity went by in terms of quarterbacks. But he is now the longest tenure quarterback. Uh, but that's enough Rodgers talk. We're going to talk about him <laughs> all offseason. But before we move on from Tom Brady, uh, I actually heard the fantasy footballers talking about this. So I wanted to get your advice. Do you drop Tom Brady in a dynasty league or do you hold him for a year? If he pulls a Brett Favre, where are your thoughts on the fantasy aspect of it? Are you trying to keep hold on to Tom Brady as long as you can? Are you dropping him immediately? I know off seasons are coming up. You're starting to make moves depending on how intense your dynasty league is. What are your thoughts on Tom Brady heading into 2022? Well, if I have the choice, like some of our dynasty leagues do, of holding him on your injured reserve spot and keeping his rights essentially um, until his contract expires on your roster, whatever your league's rules are, I would definitely do that. I don't think there's any reason to straight drop him if they give you an opportunity to hold the rights of a retired player. If that's not the case in your league, I honestly don't think I don't see much of a chance of him coming back with how this hall went down. But I would probably try to hold him as long as you can in the offseason. So maybe hold him on your roster through the draft, the rookie draft, and then cut him when you're trying to get roster compliant before next season. Because I don't know if he would take a gap year at age 44. You'd have a very good idea if he's going to be back in the NFL before, like probably at the start of training camp, I would believe next year. I don't see anything going crazy past that when you're talking about a 44-year-old quarterback. All right, that's some good advice. Maybe he'll – I'm with you. I tend to think he's going to stay retired after all this, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe he comes out of retirement halfway through the season if the Patriots call or the Buccaneers call. But the next big news happened on February 2nd. The whole big you know, build up, a big letdown for this whole situation, but that is the Washington football team. They are now called the Washington Commanders. George, what is your initial thought on their new name? I'm going to start with the name because I, I don't know if you noticed, I purposely split to two questions on this, on our rundown for this. I think the name fits the Washington DC area. I think it is probably one of the higher up names on their list from what I saw. I mean, it wasn't my favorite, but I think they definitely could have done worse. Um, but I, the only thing that I've seen going around Twitter that I think is a good point, because it was recently a name in the AAF, it does almost sound a little bit minor league. But I don't think it's a bad name. And I think it's going to grow on people. I think a lot of initial reaction when it comes to changes like this is people trying to find excuses to hate it. And that's what you're seeing right now. I think once you go a year or two down the road, you're not going to be still hearing people complaining about the name Commanders. I think it was a solid fit for the area. And for Washington, Washington, the Washington football team is what they were. <laughs> Honestly, maybe it'll grow on me, but I can't stand it. It's okay. one of my least favorite names of any team in the NFL now. My fiance immediately texted me and she's like, that sounds like a baseball team name. And it did. It felt very much like the Cleveland Guardians, but they like changed their name overnight. They didn't spend two years it's fair. coming up to this situation. Um, it just, it feels like they, they went with the simple option. It doesn't feel like they tried to, you know, be different. It felt like, you know, commanders feels like, like the safest name you could go with was commanders. And I get it. You want to, you know, there is some history to the Washington organization. You want to pay tribute to that. To, for me though, I think you missed some big opportunities there. I mean, granted, it probably could have been worse if they were like the Washington presidents or, you mm -hmm. know, the, Wash the Washington, the Washington, Washington monuments, Def the Washington <laughs> monuments, like that would have been. So I agree with you. There is going to be worse. It's not my favorite name. It was not one of the top names I had on the list, but I am glad at the end of the day that they did pick a name and it's no longer the football team, even though there's a part of me that thinks that might've still been a better name. I know there's a lot of people arguing that too. And I think because I couldn't stand how like we'll call teams, the Eagles, the Packers, the Titans, like you couldn't say the football team. I think that was what was driving me nuts as somebody who covers the NFL. 
Like I wanted to pick a name for that reason. I think the overall Washington football team thing did grow on me a little bit. Like I could have probably dealt with it, but I am actually much more happy that they picked a name and didn't stick with that. Especially when you consider that he took two years of hyping it up and coming up with all this planning. And then if they would have just stayed with Washington football team, I think people would have literally started a riot and burned down that stadium, which might have actually helped the Washington organization. But that's not the point. Um, The second question I have on here is what are your thoughts on the logo and the jerseys? And I put this separate because I was I was fairly okay with the name commanders. I am not a big fan at all of any of the look. I mean, I like the fact that they stuck with the the burgundy and gold, but after putting this much time, kind of, but after they put this much time into coming up with a new brand, I think the logo is very basic. And I think the jerseys are just bleh. I mean, the biggest thing I saw is I almost like, I don't know if it's really the case because I feel like they haven't shown too many full jersey looks like in photos on their social medias, but. I feel like all three of the jerseys look like they belong to different teams, especially because I feel like the numbers, I feel like have a different font and look on every single jersey. There's no, nothing to keep it together. No, I got you. There's definitely no cohesiveness to those. Yes, that's the word I was going for. <laughs> There's no co- cohesiveness to the jersey. I agree with you. Um, I think the W, like they kept that consistent from the Washington rebrand. Uh, they flared it up a little bit but they didn't do much to it. Again, it was just yep. another, it seems like they went the very safe option. But where they didn't go safe and they tried to be bold, I think it they fell flat on their face, is the jerseys. I agree with you. They look like different teams. I know that was the, I asked our good friend of the show, Marcus from the First and Ten Club, asking, because he's a big Washington fan, what are your thoughts? He said, I like the jerseys, but it feels like it's for three different teams. And that's how it feels. If you had to ask me today, my favorite one is the white one. That's yeah, my favorite one of the that. three. The black one, like <laughs> I hope they only wear that once. And I don't know what that is. The burgundy one, it feels very similar. But again, it's there's not cohesiveness to it. These It doesn't feel like a home and away jersey. It feels like week one jersey, week two. Maybe that's what they're going for. Maybe they'll eventually be like the Oregon Ducks or the TCU Horn Frogs that have a new <laughs> jersey every week in college football they just have one jersey they wear and then they're on to the next like maybe that's their plan maybe they'll mix and match the whole time i mean that's i feel like the chargers do the same thing they have four jerseys but then they rotate pants and tops that they like essentially have a different uniform all season long so we'll have to definitely play it by ear hopefully it grows on us i know there have been jerseys in the past that i haven't i can't stand that have grown on me over time there's still some that I still can't stand to this day. And I feel like the commanders will be one of those. That's possible. And I just want to mention about the black ones before we move on. I felt like that was literally them feeling the need to use the new two color helmet rule. So if you don't know, like teams were vying for being able to use a second base color as their helmet color for their secondary jerseys. So Washington's two primaries have the burgundy helmet and then the black jerseys have a black helmet I almost like how they kept the numbers on the sides on the black helmet. That's my favorite thing about all the jersey combinations. But overall, I feel like the entire black jersey with them trying too hard to use that rule that goes into effect next year. Yeah, I I could see it. But I am interested to see on that same topic what other uniforms or helmets uh, get dropped off. Like, I really hope the Bengals who are in the Super Bowl next week for their all white look comes out with a white helmet with black stripes. Like, just go like Mm -hmm. a white tiger look i think that would be great um but we'll talk more you know logos and more helmet combinations as they come out the next thing on the news docket is we have some coaching updates to give you the big one is the raiders have hired josh mcdaniels and then the vikings are expected to hire rams offensive coordinator kevin o'connell quick rise for him it is not jim harbaugh i know there was some news or some sources going for that earlier in the week which leaves us opening with the Saints, Dolphins, Jaguars, and Texans still. Interesting, the Jaguars have had the most time to try to find a new head coach, and yet they are still looking. George, what is your thought on the Josh McDaniels hire? Poor Rich Passaccia. That's about all I've got to say. Like, I don't know what else that guy had to do to get that job. The players loved him. 
he brought that team from turmoil when Gruden was doing whatever to making a solid playoff run, competing with the now AFC um, representative of the Super Bowl for four quarters. And then they go out there and hire Josh McDaniels, who has had a head coaching opportunity in the past and not do well. I understand that was a long time ago. He's been under Bill Belichick for so long. But I even said last week about I didn't know if he was going to take the job because of the whole Colt Colt scenario from a few years ago. He did take this job. I still not them saying he's a bad head coaching candidate. I almost feel like they would have been better off sticking with Rich Bisaccia because of the camaraderie in the locker room. He is still an experienced coach as well. I I don't hate Josh McDaniels, the coach, like I said, but I don't like the hire in this spot. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Josh McDaniels, he, he kind of feels like the head coach that everybody wanted three years ago that never got the opportunity, and now they're, they're he's finally got that opportunity. Um, I do know, like, I wasn't on the show when you we originally talked about it, and Tyler brought it up that, you know, give Rich Bisacci a one-year deal. I never thought that would actually, you know, work out. Like, I don't think any coach would go in. Like, they don't want to be a lame duck coach. They don't want just one year left on the contract. It had been a multiple years deal, but you mentioned it. We've seen time and time again, we saw the pictures of him write, handwriting letters after their playoff loss. We saw players come out and talk about how much they love Rich Passaccia. And I think he'll bounce back on his feet. He's going to get a special teams coordinator job. And you might think that's a demotion, but remember, that's how he, he's been a special teams coordinator for years. He was the special teams coordinator before stepping in as the interim head coach. So that's what he's best at. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he goes to a team like the Chicago Bears, who have had interest in him, um, that, you know, they've had a pretty decent special teams over the years. But, you know, maybe it, that NFC North rival, the Packers have had the, one of the worst for a decade now. If he can go to a team like that and transform their special teams unit, does that make him a a better name for a head coach. Does he get more interest next year or does he kind of go to the wayside because he's no longer in the head coach um, spotlight? Definitely there. And I think the Vikings also speaking, the NFC North did get a good hire in Kevin O'Connell. Again, that can't be official until after the Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. But I agree with you there. I just hope that wherever Rich Passaccia goes, he gets the, also gets that assistant head coach tag. I know I've seen a couple of uh, coordinators or even position coaches that are rising up through the ranks they'll kind of give that little bit of extra power, that little bit of extra say in the locker room because they know that there's somebody who can make a difference to their team or deserves that little bit of an extra pay grade. And I hope that at least wherever he goes, he gets something like that to go along with his special teams coordinator tag, even though I know that is basically his, you know, position on an NFL coaching staff. Um, Out of the openings, um, I think... The Jaguars, like you mentioned, it's still funny that they are still looking, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's not a great place that coaches really want to go. Um, And we did hear earlier in the week that it seemed like Byron left, which was the leader in the locker room for that job, which we, we obviously are, have been vying for since we found out that that job was open. And now we're finding out that that might not be the case anymore. The organization's still a mess. I think they just have to go out there and get left, which if he's willing, because it's going to be a great signing for the coaching. It's going to be a great sign for the coaching staff, for the fan base and for Jacksonville in general. And they're going to go out there and find a way to screw it up. Probably. No, I think the big thing with Jacksonville is they're not a hundred percent sold on their GM. I know that was a big hang up for Byron, which he didn't want Trent Falky in there. Cause you know, the head coach GM relationship is important. He wanted a mm-hmm. guy he used to work with out in Arizona, you know, there's been reports of them bringing in the old Vikings GM for like an assistant GM to help with that relationship. I know Doug Peterson is still on the list. So they're still like working through it. And honestly, it's probably the best that they're trying to figure out all these things now instead of just doing things on the fly um, like they have in the year past because they they need a, a full rebuild. And that's what they, they need to do. They need to make sure they get the right guy in there for their potential future star in Trevor Lawrence or potential future bust in Trevor Lawrence, depending on who the next guy is, could play a big role into that one. The Saints, they're still going through, um, but for me, that feels very much like Dennis Allen's job to lose, their defensive coordinator, and then the Dolphins and the Texans. Those are two teams. Like the Jaguars, just a lot of questions um, with how their teams are and what direction their team is going. Well, it's worth noting that right now they're saying the leader for the Texans job might be Brian Flores. And man, has he had one controversial week. 
as uh, in this past week, he has filed a lawsuit against NFL teams for discrimination. Um, everyone thought that that would completely be the end of his coaching career because that's just something to re- something to really stick your neck out. Um, but the Texans seem to still be interested. Uh, but I think we have to talk about the suit. Cody, you probably know a couple extra details from what we talked about. Go ahead and try to lay out what you know. All right. So if you want to find out all the details, you can... Uh, I believe Tom Paracello on Twitter has a great Twitter feed of all like the documents for the court case. Um, but essentially what he is arguing is that the Rooney rule is essentially a sham and mm-hmm. that even with the rule that, that they're still not being um, interviewed equally, uh, which honestly we have one uh, coach of color in the NFL right now. So definitely something that could be brought up. I think this is, it is very interesting to see how this, will go um you know some of the big things are one of the big storylines coming out of this was he has a text exchange and you can see the full text uh it was leaked on the internet and uh, a part of the whole case with his former head his former boss and uh bill belichick you know he has a working relationship with him bill belichick reached out and congratulated him for it getting the giant's job uh, after a few texts back and forth, he was confused because his interview wasn't for a few more days. And then Bill Belichick, he said he effed up and it's looking like it's Brian Dayball, which is very interesting because Brian Dayball did get the job that they would, that other people outside of the organization would know that friends are talking. Um, again, now Bill Belichick isn't in the Giants organization, so it's hard to, you can understand where, you know, if it's this guy is talking, um, but you know, Bill Belichick is one of the biggest names in the NFL. He has his people. I'm sure he doesn't do this lightly. Granted, it seems like a bit, a slip up with texting the wrong Brian, unfortunately. Uh, but that's how this all thing led off. He then went back to 2019 where he was interviewed with the Denver Broncos. And he is accusing the Broncos of being over an hour late for their interview. And one of the par- members of the interview party appeared to be uh, hung over in his state and appeared to be uninterested i think that's going to be a hard one to to prove that that actually happened Mm -hmm. um without like a videotaping of the interview if that would happen i mean because that's that's all hearsay again i'm not a lawyer um and then i do know at the end of it he did you know he related some of what he's going through back with colin kaepernick and how how he has been essentially ousted out of the league whether you believe it's right or not depending on for what he did um he brought up his stats and you know some quotes by head coaches of not wanting or making it seem like he was outed for other reasons outside of his play. Uh, So definitely an inside look on how the NFL handles uh, race. Um, It's going to be, this is, this could be a huge turning point for the NFL. Uh, Hopefully it's, you know, for everyone out there, it is looked into honestly um, and truly evaluated. And honestly, because in a league that is predominantly, you know, has stars and players of color to only have one head coach of color. That feels like there is definitely something off. I'm not, I don't want to accuse anybody of racism. Um, but you know, you, when the, sometimes that's the way it, it looks like, and it appears And hopefully it turns out that it's not true. It's been a big misunderstanding. I think it's going to be hard to come to that. Um, and then the one last thing, which is a big aspect of it was he was also said one of his feuds with his former boss and owner Stephen Ross in Miami was that he was offered a hundred thousand dollars a game that they lost when they were trying to tank for the first pick. There was also some speculation that they wanted him to, because he had a working relationship with the Patriots. He wanted him to talk to Tom Brady before he was a free agent to try to sway him into coming to Miami. So there's a lot of red flags in this whole situation. And again, it's another, you know, hit our mark against the NFL and hopefully the truth comes to light and the NFL and the players and the people, coaches and everyone involved comes out better on the other side. Man, I hope so too. Um, And just to piggyback onto that a hundred thousand dollars for losing another coach of color Brown's former head coach, Hugh Jackson also claimed that the Browns paid him extra money to lose games. And that I believe was in the season he went 0 and 16 um, so he was coming to Brian Flores back and said, I have something that can help you too. I agree with you. I've seen this. Apparently they said 
that that was something that it was already reported to the NFL and they had looked at, but nothing ever came of it. But now it's going to have to get a second look over. The Browns organization basically came out to Hugh Jackson and said, we never did that. Go prove it. So I'm hoping Hugh Jackson has some kind of record of that to come back out and show that it was true. He was getting bonuses for going on 16 in that season. But for this sure. whole thing seems like an absolute mess. And I mean, I, I'll let you say what you're going to say, but I was going to ask you because Tyler and I already spoke on it on the show, what your thoughts overall were on the Rooney rule. Um, and if it really is a sham, like people are saying. Uh, well, I'll answer that quick. Um, mm-hmm. I think the Rooney rule is good in theory, but not executed properly or to the point where almost we don't, we shouldn't be in a world, and this is outside of football. We shouldn't be in a world where we have to, you know, interview a person of color because it's mandated. We should be interviewing Mm -hmm. who we think are the best candidates. We should be interviewing who we think would be the best fit for our job. It should, it shouldn't like race shouldn't have a, you know, a say in it at all. And I don't want to get too political on here. Um, but that's just honestly how I feel like you, I don't understand why, why we need the Rooney rule is the bigger problem than it actually having it. That in my personal opinion, again, it needs to be, we need to find some way to, you know, get, have an equal playing field. And that's going to take, you know, take work from all of us. It takes all of us, you know, you see that in the back of helmets all the time. And honestly, that's what's going to have to happen. I was going to say, speaking of Brian Flores, though, and, you know, outside of the whole the whole race thing and, you know, him being discriminated against, which he might have some valid points. I think there's like two like that's one big problem of this. But the whole tanking and encouraging players that tank is like a whole other side of the story, which I'm not saying it's not being talked about enough because I feel like this whole thing is being talked about and props to the NFL. They have covered it. They have, from everything I've seen, they have not shied away from asking tough questions, mm-hmm. at least from the media side. Whether what they're doing behind closed doors, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I want to get your thoughts. Like, how would you feel if you found out that the Eagles paid Doug Peterson a hundred thousand dollars to lose games? How would you feel if, if you know, if Aaron Rodgers comes back but gets hurt in week three, and they give Matt Lafleur a hundred thousand dollars to lose games to get a better draft pick, like? As a fan, how do you go in? So it'd be hard to get your fans to come support you again after, you know, we're okay with losing. Like that is just such a bad yeah. mindset to have. Whether we need to reevaluate the draft, maybe we need to go to a draft lottery so you're not guaranteed a spot like the NBA does for tanking because the, the NBA doesn't try to avoid it too. Now, granted, if you're the worst team, you have the best odds, but that doesn't guarantee you the top spot. We've seen in the mm-hmm. NBA, the top spot fall all the way down to the middle of the first or not the middle of the first round, but we've seen them fall, you know, to three to seven, like there's been big falls and that's because it's a lottery system. Sometimes it's just not your year. So I think evaluating that and, you know, if that is a big integrity of the game aspect of it too, that, you know, especially with a guy like Steven Ross, where and this is going to be hold, down a rabbit hole that we should wrap up soon, but there <laughs> he invested in a gambling company. And then Ooh. he was offering to pay <laughs> coaches, his coach, a hundred thousand dollars to lose games. Like those are big red flags that like big corporation that us, this, this little podcast isn't going to be able to answer. We uh-huh. have to see how it unfolds, but this story is wild. And hopefully like the race aspect of it gets handled and hopefully we can move past this of needing a Rooney rule. Everybody gets looked at equally. It's not going to happen overnight, but that's where the goal is. I hope we get to eventually uh, and sooner rather than later. And, but this whole other, you know, punishments for tanking, you know, this whole ch- changing games, the, the insider trading, essentially, of what that could be. There's a lot to unfold here. And luckily, the offseason just got started because they're going to need all offseason to uh, unravel this. <laughs> we might need two offseasons to rat- unravel all of this, honestly, because, like, we've thought other lawsuits in the league have been groundbreaking like what's going on with the washington football team a few years ago with the whole cheerleader scandal and their owner and everything else but there's so many layers that have been unfolded on this and i'll focus on the tanking games just so we can uh keep the show moving and because that is something that obviously as fans as fantasy players everything else really does affect us um i hate it i remember being a philadelphia sports fan back when the philadelphia 76ers were tanking um 
and all of the backlash that was heard around. Um, I, I mean, I obviously wasn't a fan of it either. You always want to see your team trying to compete. And when they're purposely, you know, losing game, I don't want to say they're purposely losing games, but it's still hard to see your team selling off pieces to purposely make themselves worse. Um, but at the same time, there's a chess match. You have to let teams play too. Like there you're, it's hard to say that Miami did wrong in tanking. They didn't, I mean, you obviously can see that Brian Flores didn't purposely lose games because he has a good record as a head coach. That team still responded despite them selling all those players for first round draft picks. But what they did work still because those first round picks ended up working out for them to make a much faster turnaround in their rebuild than we all expected. So you, it's hard to find the fine line between not letting a team sell off assets and them tanking there. You should never be um, giving money to your coach to tell him to go lose games. Just like sports gambling should not be an insider thing inside a team, inside a locker room, inside an ownership group. But you almost don't want to handcuff a team from trying to get better by selling assets for draft picks. So it's hard to find that balance. And that's something that, yeah, as a small podcast, we're never going to be able to answer. We just have to hope the NFL comes up with a good solution. Right. And again, I'm not like, I think it'd be hard to like fully penalize, you know, teams for tanking. Now, if you find out they're co- you're, you're paying them to lose, well then, yeah, that's definitely something that needs to be taken uh, into account. That's why I mentioned the lottery system. You know, even if you think about mm-hmm. it in a fantasy sp- perspective, uh, like we do in our league, when you have you have the consolation bracket, right? And a lot of people often say, what's the point of even playing the consolation bracket? It doesn't matter if you finish 6th through 10th. Like, you're not in the playoffs. You're not getting a championship. It, it doesn't matter. But in our league, we try to, because we want it to be a competitive season the whole way through. It's not perfect. Some teams still take it less seriously than others. We understand that. But we mm-hmm. added, you know, a rule where, you know, each, wherever you finish, you essentially, it's a lottery for the right to pick where you draft the following year. So there is some reward for even in the consolation bracket. Now that's what it'll be interesting to see how we go. I mean, the NFL hasn't done a draft lottery. I still have a hard time believing they'll go there. Uh, But again, we've talked a lot about this and I'm sure we're going to talk about it a lot more. Uh, But George, I think we have some definitely good quotes. So why don't we head to your favorite segment quotes of the week? Quotes of the week this week, and I'm going to try not to mess up um, a a tweet or two that Cody sent me this week. We're going to see how it goes. I'm going to start off in (laughs) no promises. I'm going to start off in Chicago where the Bears GM said, quote, we're going to take the North and never give it back. He said that in the uh, introductory press conference for the new head coach. Um, I laughed. I don't know what reaction Cody had here, but I could tell you that my first reaction was laughing out loud and texting back Cody saying, man. It pays to dream sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> Dude, look, I'm not going to say the Bears. I mean, the Bears suck. And I'm, as a Packers fan, I'm obligated to say that. I believe that the Bears can win the Super Bowl, and I'll still tell you they suck. But <laughs> we're going to give the, take the North and never give it back. Like, one, when you're saying that in your – like, that's how he – that was his final statement in his introductory press conference. And when winning the North is your mo- – it wasn't – we're going to win the North and we're going to win championships. It was, we're going to, that was his final statement. He stopped. So it, the bears, their whole goal is to win their division. That's what the, that's what they're, that guy's literally telling you. We win the division. We're good. You know, some teams, they want to win Super Bowls. The bear, I'm not saying, I'm sure the guy wants to win. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> win Super Bowls. But yeah, that's how it came across to me as a Packers fan. It felt very much like the, there was a picture after, you know, Matt Nagy's first year and, you know, Mitch Trubisky kind of looked okay. They, you know, they went to the playoffs, stuff like that. There was a picture of Mitch Trubisky holding a yellow cup that they put and someone put the Packers logo and the word tears under that circled around the internet. There was, you know, some articles that came out, you know, that said the bears are taking over Aaron Rodgers is washed, blah, blah, blah. And they all made great freezing cold take posts a few years later. And I feel like this quote will be another one of those that the Packers will win the North next year. And, well, maybe it's, maybe the quote doesn't become a freezing cold take until they actually win the North because it'd be the year they give it back. 
Uh, but definitely, it was definitely a fun quote for the Bears in the Packers, Bears, Vikings, Lions rivalry. Yep. Yeah, and I think that is that division as a whole is one of the best like cumulative division rivalries in the NFL. So I, I'd, I'd like to see the Bears be a more competitive team just for the sake of the NFL. Like they've been. Oh, the NFL's better when the Bears are just, good. They are. Yeah. Because I mean, the Bears Packers rivalry is better. The Bears always seem to make a good playoff story when they are a competitive team. And I always just like cold weather playoff games. It's nice to see people have to go up to the frozen tundra in green Bay or go up to Chicago in the wind in the winter. And so I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with the bears. Um, I'm going to skip down to uh, our second quote as the lions general manager talking about potentially trading the number two overall pick in the draft. He said, I'm never scared to move around. So Something to watch as we move into NFL draft season. Obviously, our um, focus after the Super Bowl moves to free agency. But after that, the draft, the Lions, if they think that there's no quarterback up there for them to take and Jared Goff is their best option, you might see them trading down. And who knows who can go up there to maybe get an offensive line piece or a top defender if there's no quarterback that they want or go get one of the few quarterbacks that people are actually looking at in this draft. Yeah, this this draft is so interesting because it could be the draft that has the most trades ever, and it can also be mm-hmm. the draft that has the least amount of trades ever. <laughs> because honestly, like there's no quarterback worth taking in the top five. So our team's no. gonna over trade to get into that pick when they know they could trade up probably. You know, with the team at <laughs> probably they will, <laughs> but at the same time, like why trade to five when you can take a quarterback at seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty-four? Like there will be quarterback because there's not, you know, a top end talent. So we'll see how the Lions are moving. And that's the right approach. Like, honestly, like you should never be scared to to move around for draft picks. Like if someone offers you five first round picks for your number two pick, yeah, absolutely. Like, what are you scared of? You know, you got to do what's best for your team. So the Lions, they're going with Dan Campbell, their GM. It feels like they're going in the right direction, but I'm sure they're going to lie in eventually. But, I just know. have one question for you before we move on to our other quote, though. Uh, just Dude, to give the fans an the idea. Best transition. I just want you to know. Oh, good, good. Um, for people out there that don't follow college football a lot or don't really know much about the quarterback class, besides us saying it's weak, how would you compare the top quarterback in this class right now to Mac Jones, who was taken four? I think it was fourteenth overall last year. Okay, so for for me, as you know, a talent, you know, um low end talent evaluator of college quarterbacks, which I don't spend a ton of time doing. Um, Mm -hmm. I would say they're pretty, they're pretty similar in a sense where I would probably take Kenny Pickett over Mac Jones only because he has, I feel like with Mac Jones and whether he has limitations, right? Like there's not as high of a ceiling for Mac Jones. He had the lowest floor. He was he was considered the safest pick, right? And I think he is he is still would be the safest pick, and he would be argue you know be a tough draw for quarterback one in this class over a guy like Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett, you know, he's a senior. You know, he came on strong late at Pittsburgh. You know, that's the guy we're looking at right now. It's the potential first overall quarterback taken off the on the in the draft. He has a little bit more upside. So do you want the upside or do you want the safe pick? It'll be the same question. Do you want Zach Wilson or do you want Mac Jones? True. Except I don't think Kenny Pickett has this as big of a ceiling as Zach Wilson. Mm-hmm. So that's where I think we're at with the drafts. I think Mac Jones would be, he would actually probably be the favorite quarterback because of his pedigree. You know, he'd be a safer pick, a guy that you would take. Um, but it, it's not that wow factor that you would, again, that's why I don't think we'll see many quarterbacks taken in the top five. Gotcha. And I am very sorry for stealing your transition there. You can do your best to piece it back together. All right. So my transition for anyone that cares, we were talking about lions and staying on the same topic of animals. We're going to talk about gorillas and you're like gorillas. There's no team in the NFL talking about gorillas. (laughs) And that is because we need to, you know, give a shout out or not a shout out, but just in remembrance of the gorilla that we lost in 2016 in the Cincinnati zoo Harambe quick moment of silence. All right, but Sam Hubbard, the defensive end for the Cincinnati Bengals, said we're doing this for him when they were talking about winning the Super Bowl for Harambe, which 
I don't know how this question even came up, how we got there. It was just a quote I saw on the internet, and I immediately was like, George, it has to be in quotes of the week. I don't I don't know anything about it. I didn't research anything else about it. I don't know how don't we know got there's anything to research about it. <laughs> but, you know, the bank was by a thousand because they're doing it for Harambe. Man, lions and bangles and gorillas all in one quotes of the week segment and bears. Actually, we're we're really covering all the bases. And her, her, I, I want to say something we probably shouldn't say on the podcast, but let's do it for Harambe. Cody, I think that's enough for quotes of the week. Why don't we move on to the main segment of the show? Our way too early mock draft. Oh, Harambe. Oh, Harambe. (laughs) So for our mock draft here, we are going to be doing three rounds of a 12-team mock draft. Now, obviously, there's just two of us. We are actually going to be drafting every single team here. We're not going to be doing any sim style thing like we did preseason last year because we want to really break down how we see the rankings shaking out early here for next season. Obviously, a lot can change, but fun little exercise here to fill the bye week for the Pro Bowl. Um, So what we're going to do here, Cody will have the final say on all of the odd picks. I will have the final say on all the even, but we will be going back and forth here talking. So why don't we just kick it right off here? Round one, pick one. Top of the board, this year's interesting. We don't know if it's going to be a running back first. Wide receivers are creeping up the board. Or if it is, it's probably going to be a running back. Which one? Cody, where do you think you want to go first overall? For me, the, the first pick is easy. Okay. It, it really is. I, I know, it's for me, you're still going running back at the top of the draft. Okay. Um, I think there's realistically only two running backs that have potential to be superstars well i shouldn't say that are safe picks to be superstars i think there's some others lower in the draft board that we'll get to that have some you know bounce back potential um but for me it is the guy that you know was in the mvp argument he got the most you know red zone carries attempts ever for a quarterback that is or for a running back i should say that is jonathan taylor running back for the indianapolis colts for me, he is hands. He'll probably be my number one running back all, you know, all season long. Especially, you know, and if we're looking, we don't know who their quarterback will be. We expect it to be Carson Wentz. You know, maybe if they go out and get a guy like Aaron Rodgers, you know, think he'll be more a little bit more pass heavy. You know, go out and get a Russell Wilson, get be a little more pass heavy. I might, you know, then start consider Derrick Henry for a number one. Uh, but with Carson Wentz wanting to run the ball, how much they used in Jonathan Taylor, what their record was when they were. He had 100 yard rushing games versus they weren't. I believe they only they only lost one game that he had over 100 yard rushing, but they didn't win a single one when he didn't have 100 yards rushing. Uh, that just goes to show on how important he is. So for me, first overall, one on one, no questions asked, Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, I don't think I pro- I would have argued you too much there. I think there's probably two running backs that I would consider at the top of the board, which is weird because I feel like there's. The last few years, it's always been a group of four, a group of five, a group of six. I think I've narrowed down to two. So you took your guy, Jonathan Taylor, at number one. I'm going to take the other guy in that group, in my opinion, at number two. And maybe it sounds sketchy because he didn't have a great playoff appearance when he came back from his injury, but that's Derrick Henry. So we have to worry a little bit because this is the first time he's actually missed time, significant time for injury. He's been one of the top running backs because obviously he does put up big games, but he's been so durable and hasn't missed much time. But I think that this, the foot injury is kind of a fluke thing. It's not like he tore his ACL and it's something that we think is going to have more of a long-term effect. Um, I'm not worried about the playoff game because I think, he, he he's always been a running back that needs to take time to get up to speed evidenced by the fact that weeks one through three are his weakest part of the season. He always, once he hits like week five, six, seven, he comes on to mid season, Derrick Henry and starts rolling over people for 200 yards at will. So he's still my guy. I'm not worried about the injury. I'm not worried about him starting slow because we've seen it so many times and I don't like drafting for injuries anyway. There's just so many running backs that it's starting to creep in my head for some of those running backs. You have to, he's not one in that group yet. Yeah. For me, Derek Henry would be number two. I am. I was worried about it last year I've, or I said it during our draft shows. I did think that there might be a chance of injury because he's used so much. 
and he is getting up there in, in terms of age for a running back. Now, Derrick Henry is not built like most running backs. He can take definitely a beating. So I will have some hesitations, you know, have that thought in the back of my mind. Will he be able to make it a full season? But I'm still going to bet on Derrick Henry to do so, at least for this year. You know, as the years progress, I think we'll have to take that more into consideration. So I do like your pick uh, for two overall at Derrick Henry. Moving on to number three overall, this is where I think the draft really starts. Mm -hmm. I think most drafts, all the way up until it's time to draft, unless one of them has an offseason injury, which we're not hoping for, they'll go one, two in some order in most drafts. Mm -hmm. Number three is by far the most interesting, you know, because we used to have a big four of running backs. I don't think yeah. we have a big four anymore. Do you start taking a wide receiver here? What wide that receiver the, do you take? If which you do? wide receiver do you take? Do you <laughs> chase Cooper Cup, which I don't think we realize how good Cooper Cup has a season. Again, I'm stealing this quote from the Fantasy Footballers podcast. They do great work, um, and I take a lot of stuff from them. But they, if Cooper Cup was the number one wide receiver hands down in fantasy football in 2020, he had 16 touchdowns. If you take away the points for all 16 of those touchdowns, where does he finish? You want to take a guess? Uh, I'll say wide receiver three. Five. But you were close. Wide receiver five. <laughs> I, I thought I was pretty high. <laughs> he was in wide receiver five on the season, taking away 16 touchdowns. This is insane. And that's absolutely that's what, insane. So Derrick Henry is in consideration for me. Or, I'm sorry, Cooper Cup. I don't know. We're still, Derrick Henry was the last pick. I was reading the, the, the rundown when I was talking. <laughs> Cooper Cup is in consideration. Do I still go running back here? I'm debating if I would go running back here, it would be a, a guy like Najee Harris or Austin Eckler. Those would be the next two running backs on my okay. my big board. Okay. I, I passed, you know, CMC, Dalvin. Like, one of those guys would be the next on my big board. But I think I'm going to go with Cooper Cup. I'm oh. not even guaranteeing that he'll be wide receiver one next year. Like, I think Devontae Adams could still be that. But with right now, with the question marks of where Adams will be, I mean, if Adams was with Rodgers, I think you have a – this makes this conversation even more, but we don't know this at this time. So, for me, I think Cooper Cup, as long as Matt Stafford's there, Matt Stafford likes to tend into a guy. I know they want Odell Beckham Jr. back. I know they have Van Jefferson. I know Robert Woods will be back. But we saw all season Cooper Cooper Cup's worst game was nine and a half points in, in half-point PPR last year. Like, even if he gets – a half of the production, he is still a valuable top pick in the draft. It's true. I mean, I was, I didn't know where to go wide receiver, like how early to go wide receiver. I think Cup was probably my top guy, but you understand how, like, I would be a little skeptical because I hate wide receiver trios and I, I believe Odell Beckham will probably be back. I know Robert Woods will be coming back at least at some point next season from his ACL injury, whether it not be week one, it'd probably still be early part of the season. And then they have three, four guys. If we count Van Jefferson too, it's a crowded offense. But like you said, Matt Stafford just seemed to take a liking to Cooper cup. Cooper cup has stepped up in so many ways to almost become that quarterback playing wide receiver. So you can almost, you know, blindly throw the ball to him and know exactly where he's going to be, which is the quarterback's best friend. That's why we always talk about the tight end, because normally tight ends are running those check down routes or the routes that's very predictable for the quarterback to read. Cooper Cup is almost that guy, except he's so much more explosive being able to run after the catch, run more routes than a normal tight end does. It's amazing what he did. And that stat of him finishing fifth with no touchdowns is something I didn't know. And it's absolutely unbelievable. Now we move on to pick four. Um, I don't know if I want to take another wide receiver right away. I would probably stick with the running back game. And I didn't want to sound like somebody who was still jumping on the Austin Eckler hype train, but now knowing that he's also in your next group of running backs, he might be the guy I would lean right here at number four, especially when we're talking in a half PPR format, which is the way we like to play. He gets so many catches out of the backfield. He while he might not be the most durable, he is one of the higher ceilings at running back right now and one of the more consistent guys when he is on the field. So I'm going to stick with Austin Eckler at four. And I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a great pick. That's who I would have taken if you didn't. He would have been my next guy. Um, okay. I don't have the full stats in front of me, but he did only miss one game last year. So he sh was pretty durable. I believe he only he didn't have a single rushing touchdown outside of the red zone 
So like he didn't have any big rushing, you know, what you worry about him being more of a short yardage guy with the style of back he is, but knowing that he is a short yardage guy in that offense still is good to know. And it's, you know, it's a high powered offense. We expect, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of points from, and we, so I think Eckler is a good fit here. That puts me back on the clock again at pick five. And again, it's another tough, you know, situation. Do I go back to the wide receiver? Well, do I go with another running back? Um, I think for me at this point, I'm going to stick with the running back. And this is one of my least favorite picks of the whole, the whole draft is pick five. I feel like it is no matter where we're at. Uh, But for pick five, I'm going to take Najee Harris. Now he had, you know, an incredible season. The big question mark, who is going to be at quarterback? Because he got a lot of his points last year coming off receptions because Big Ben, you know, was checking it down a lot to him. Mm -hmm. But he is one of the few full-time workload running backs we have in the NFL. You can argue his workload was even bigger than Jonathan Taylor because he had guys like Naeem Hines uh, behind him that would get some playing field. Najee Harris was on the field like 90% of the times and 90% of the games. Like, he just got the workload. Now that does scare me a little bit. I will say that we could have saw his ceiling his rookie year, and it doesn't get he doesn't ever reach that potential. I do think you have that with Najee Harris, um, but he's a young guy. He could be the focal point of this offense. Again, the quarterback is a huge question mark, but I do think he is warranted enough for the fifth overall pick. Yeah, I mean. Uh, because he is one of the guys who is a true three down back left in the league. Like th- those three really, I mean, I don't even know, I guess Eckler is technically playing as a three down back, but he doesn't normally fit the mold of three down back. Um, those guys have to go at the top of the list. And now after that, I'm left with, do I go to my next tier of running backs or do I go back to the wide receiver position? Um, I am honestly, I'm just going to tell you, I'm really torn between two guys. And that would be going back to Christian McCaffrey because I know of his upside. You just hope he stays healthy because you know, if he does, he can go off for 20 points every single week or going to Devonte Adams, because I think there's a very good chance of no matter where he goes, he's going to be with Aaron Rodgers. It just seems like that is the way it's going to go. He's a free agent. If Rodgers leaves Green Bay, he said he wants to go with. So. I think I'm going to take the slightly, I, I don't know if it's a safer pick or not. I'll take the safer pick and I'm going to go with Devontae Adams, get two running backs off the board in the first half of the first round, which is very unlike not only my draft strategy, but the draft strategy of most fantasy owners in these last few years. No, I'm with you. I Adams was in consideration for me with Najee Harris. Um, I do think it's also worth noting. Yeah. You, the quarterback is definitely a big question mark at this point. Don't get me wrong. Um, there is the reports out there that, you know, Rogers, wherever he goes, wants Adams with him, so on, so on. If Adams is a free agent with that said, I don't expect Adams to ever hit the market. I think it'll be franchise tag. Um, so the, the pipe dream of him going with Adams Rogers, if Rogers retires or goes somewhere else could not be a reality in all honesty, mm-hmm. which I understand why he wants there. Adams is like on the brink of a hall of fame career. So he wants to stay with the hall of fame quarterback to make sure he gets a gold jacket. Yeah. But I will remind you that Adam's coming out party, statement party, saying I've arrived in the NFL, did not come with Aaron Rodgers. It came with Brett Hundley. Oh. Aaron Rodgers missed some games with a broken collarbone. It, that was the year that Devonta Adams broke out. You, we started to see glimmers of hope. We saw it early in the season with Rodgers. But Devonta Adams showed his dominance in the NFL with Brett Hundley as quarterback. So I think Adams is pretty safe no matter who is the quarterback, whether it's Jordan Love, whether it's Aaron Rodgers, whether it's Derek Carr, whether it's someone else. I think Adams is a safe guy. Now, granted, if it's not Rodgers, he might drop a few more picks. He might go behind the guy that I'm going to take with the next pick. I'm actually going to stay with the wide receivers. And for my next pick at pick seven, the guy that I think has potential and another big question mark on who the quarterback will be, but that is Justin Jefferson. He has been dominant his first two seasons as a pro. He's always open. Even when Adam Thielen went out this past year, we we're like, oh, they'll just double cover Justin Jefferson. They didn't. He is a rising star in the league. If he doesn't have Kirk Cousins, I still think he'll be, you know, a solid top wide receiver option. 
Um, you know, if Adams doesn't have Aaron Rodgers, I might actually flip these two. Um, but for me, Justin Jefferson fits right in here at pick seven. All right. I mean, he was he would have been the other wide receiver in my, I guess, second tier of wide receivers. If you want to put Cobra Cup alone in the top tier at this point. Um, but I still think Adams is a safer pick. I don't I don't hate you taking Jefferson there, but I think that kind of locks me in at pick eight with going with the upside and going with Christian McCaffrey. Because at pick eight, I feel a little bit more confident that I can have a solid second round pick come back around to me. If McCaffrey does end up having another injury riddled season, I think you can probably balance it out a little bit better, but there's no doubt that you're getting a steal at pick eight. If McCaffrey stays on the field, because, oh my God, if I could turn an eighth, an eighth overall pick into 20 points a week, I would be doing it every single day. So the, I, I, I understand a lot of people have a grudge against him. He just can't fall much further than this in drafts, in my opinion, knowing his upside. Yeah, I, I am with you. CMC was in consideration at pick seven. I do like him here at pick eight. Again, this is a great spot to be in because you have potential to get the number one running back in fantasy at pick eight. That is a huge win for you if it happens. Now, it's been three years since we've actually seen that happen. So there's a lot of question marks. Will he stay healthy? It's a big one. You know the risk you're taking, but I do like the pick there at pick eight. I'm on to pick nine. I'm staying with another injured running back or running back that gets injured, you know, decently amounts of times. It sucks to say I'm staying with the Minnesota Vikings, though. My next pick will be Dalvin Cook. Again, these are guys that, you know, were top four draft picks the last two seasons. They're falling a little bit because they can't stay healthy. You know, Dalvin Cook had his big game that came back, you know, he, but he then lost a lot of people in the playoffs. He was very up and down near the end of the season. There's a lot of grudge against him. And again, you shouldn't draft, you know, players that, you know, hurt you in years prior. You shouldn't, you know, take a stance against them. But I know for me personally, like I will never draft draft DeAndre Hopkins as good as he is. (laughs) He just never is consistent enough for me when he's on my team. I love him as a player. I love watching him on Sundays, but he will never be on my fantasy football team. That's just how it goes. That's not how you should play fantasy football. I'm not advocating for it, but I understand why there are people out there like that. And again, I think eight and nine as of our draft seems like a sweet spot because of the potential, but you also going in realizing that uh, you could be disappointed. And I will say that Alexander Mattinson is a free agent this year, so he might not be back. So look at that Vikings depth chart if you do get Dalvin Cook. Man, what are the odds that Madison goes somewhere and gets a starting gig? And how high would you take him if he gets a starting gig? It would depend on the team, for <laughs> sure. You know, who they have, will it be a committee? That kind of, you know, aspect of it too. But, like, if he goes, you know, we, we talked about this off, and I don't want to, like, spoil any picks, but we talked about Melvin Gordon going to the Buffalo Bills and how great that would be. But Alexander Madison would be right there with a guy yeah. that would make a lot of sense for the Bills. Even though Devin Singletary – Hey, he's making me think about him in this draft, the way he's been playing in the playoffs, but definitely worth taking a look at. Definitely. Um, So now we move on to pick number 10. We're getting closer to the turn. It might be somewhere you can take a couple other risks. Um, I'm debating a wide receiver or two in this pick, but the traditionalist in me has the running backs winning out. And I'm going to go with a guy who made a lot of rise on the draft board. I think from his play this season, and he might still be a little bit of a risk. Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon's Mm going to go for me here at pick 10. I mean, maybe I'm a bigger Mixon guy than some people, but I think he definitely falls solidly into this next group of backs. Like he was constantly going as a late second round pick last year. Now I think he's going to fall into this like Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara kind of area, which is near the end of the first round. And for whatever reason, he's just my favorite of that group at the moment. No, I Joe Mixon finishes running back three, and he's not getting any respect. Now, yeah. he ha- he wasn't as consistent as you might have liked. He had some rough Which spots is probably in the why middle of the season. Far. And I think the bigger question is, you know the playmakers they have on offense. We've seen Joe Barrow carrying this team. How much are they, are they still going to be a, a run-heavy team moving into next season? I think that's a huge question mark. Um, I do like Joe Mixon a lot. I do have two other running backs ahead of him on my way too early rankings. But again, I'm a huge Joe Mixon fan. I feel like I always have to nerf myself on how much I talk about Joe Mixon. So (laughs) I I love the pick there at pick 11 though. 
it's going to be tough for me on, you know, running back or wide receiver. And the big question mark is Debo Samuel. Mm -hmm. He was, he finished as wide receiver number two. He had all the, the receiving touchdowns, reception yards, but then he second half of the season, he added the rushing touchdowns. They're expected to, you know, Elijah Mitchell will be back. They traded up to get Trey Sermon. Will they bring Raheem Mostert back on a cheap contract recovering from his ACL injury? Will this go or will he be used as much? That's why I'm at such a hard time with Debo Samuel. Will, will the quarterback play a difference? You know, Trey Lance, could this be a run first offense with, you know, him being more of a gadget player? You know, that could be a very interesting formula for me. And then there's the guy that I feel like gets lower and lower every year. For me, I'm having a hard time debating between is Alvin Kamara. Those are the, the two guys I'm really, you know, debating hard here at pick 11. Um, but I think I'm going to shoot for the, st the stars, take the high upside here and go with Debo Samuel. Mm, I like it. So Debo Samuel there at 11. And that gives me an idea on the turn because I, I, I honestly would have probably picked Debo Samuel on the turn because I like the upside. I like how much he is breaking out. And he probably was the second most effective wide receiver in the league this year but behind Cooper Cup. I mean, you can throw Devontae Adams up in there as well. But like when you talk about those explosive guys that deserve, um, you know, MVP conversation, all that Debo Samuel's right up there below Cooper Cup. So being able to get somebody with that kind of upside at number 11 and knowing you're coming back in two picks to get another guy is a solid pick. Um, I've traditionally been somebody on the turn who went to running back. I almost think this year, even though there's more wide receivers going in the first round than ever before, most likely I want to go running back slash wide receiver here back to back. So I'm just going to announce my first pick and it's going to be the walking touchdown Tyree kill. So this is about where he went last year. I don't think he did anything to warrant getting any worse. I understand he was inconsistent, but he still obviously has the ability to go up there and put 40 points up on a whim. So knowing that you can take him and come right back around and get a solid RB one in the next pick is why I'm taking Tyree kill there. I like it. I had one other guy in ahead of him on my, <laughs> my rankings, but I think it is a very value argument on Tyree kill. And now, going into the second round, pick 13, I, in this tier of running backs, are so close. Because I already mentioned that I have Nick Chubb in this tier. I mentioned I have Alvin Kamara in this tier. And I have Javante Williams as well. Javante Williams might be a little bit of a risk because you don't know what he's going to be like as a solid number one guy if Melvin Gordon does leave. Or for whatever reason they bring him back, which I don't see happening. He ends up being in a split again, and he's good, but not great. <laughs> uh, but I really like him being a star running back. But do I like him more than the upside we know Alvin Kamara could have? That's my question. I think on a whim here, I'm going to go ahead and take Kamara at this pick. But I was really strongly considering Javante Williams. Good. Javante Williams, my next pick. <laughs> See, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was that high on there. <laughs> no, I had Kamara slightly a little bit higher. He is ranked one spot higher for me, but I like Javante Williams. I think he'll do well. Um, I do think they'll get a, another back in there to, you know, split some time with them. He does come. I mean, their new head coaches, Nathaniel Hackett, they're bringing over the Packers tight end coach to be the offensive coordinator. They're bringing in the Vikings uh, offensive coordinator to be the quarterback's coach. So there's a lot of familiarity on that system of, you know, wanting to be two running backs, but, building off of the run. So I do like Javante Williams. Don't be afraid if they do bring in a second running back, he'll get sprinkled in intermittently, but he showed he could be a guy out of the backfield as a pass catcher. Um, so I think Javante Williams, and I think sitting here at, with team 11, getting Debo Samuel and Javante Williams, they are both, this team doesn't feel safe at this point. It feels like big reaches, but if you actually evaluate the players this early in the process, you think, wow, I really like this combo and setting myself up to succeed down, down the stretch. Definitely. I mean, and it's kind of a toss up of like, do you like Samuel or Williams better? It's like Hill or Kamara, like Hill and Kamara have been the guys that have been around and have both been first round picks multiple times. And we know that they have that big upside. 
Samuel and Williams seem to be the new kids on the block. Like, I mean, Samuel's been around for a few years, but this was really his breakout year. And yeah, you like you said, it does feel like they're reaches, but they're really not reaches. These guys have shown that they belong to be picked this high. They have a chance to be difference makers in fantasy. Maybe taking both of them together is a little bit of a risk, but I personally like it. Um, so we're going back to team 10 here with our next pick. We already have Joe Mixon on there. So I, I kind of want to go with a wide receiver here. And the next guy on my wide receiver board is Jamar Chase. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick it. Um, Ooh. I know that's bold because you already have Mixon. That's two in the same offense in the first two rounds. Not something I normally advise, but it's a way too early ranking. I want to show that I have Jamar Chase above the next you know, next set of receivers. But maybe it's a risk that you want to take if you do think it's going to be an offense that's going to be consistent. That was one of the more consistent offenses this season, even against strong defenses. Like you have an example, like they go against Baltimore and they put up 40 points. Teams were struggling a lot of times when they don't have a solid offense to put up 20 on them. So it's bold. I'm just going to go with it. Wow. The doubling up on the Bengals. George is all in on the hype train. Make sure you grab Evan McPherson about a round 12 <laughs> for that team. Make sure you go full, full Bengals uh, heading into next year. Uh, but I do like the pick. I don't know if I would have paired him with Joe Mixon if I was um, yeah. looking for a, you know, another w- option. I do have, I did have one more wide receiver um, a little bit higher and he's still available. Um, So I'll take him now. He's a former teammate of Dalvin Cook and that is Stefan Diggs. I do know he had a little bit of a down year this past year. I know there's a new offensive coordinator here um, with Brian Dayball getting the job with the Giants. But Diggs, you saw he would get the targets. I know everyone's going to remember the Gabriel Davis four touchdown game. You know, Isaiah McKenzie got a few snaps, Cole Beasley, Emmanuel Sanders. But I think some of those guys, like Emmanuel Sanders, probably moves on. Cole Beasley, we'll see what he comes back. And I think Diggs becomes a more prominent part of this offense. Um, And he is one of the, you know, the top end wide receivers. You know, we were taking him around the same spot last year. There was some disappointment, uh, but I think he'll rebound nicely heading into 2022. Yes, I mean, Diggs and Chase were close. I think I just like Chase better, and I get the whole it was sketchy to do that, but I think pairing Dalvin Cook with Stephon Diggs is a solid draft strategy there. Moving on to Team 8, who has Christian McCaffrey. Now, how bold do you want to go with somebody that you took as a risk but with high upside? Like, do you want to go all in on the, I'm going to take high upside here, or do you want to try to bring it back and be more safe? But the other thing is, how safe do you go here? Like, there's I'm going bold. If I took CMC, I'm going bold. Okay. That's okay that'll push me to my that'll push me in that. All right, I'll go Travis Kelsey. Take oh, the tight end position early. Okay, I wasn't I, that was not where I thought you were going. Okay. okay. I mean, there's a couple of, there were a couple running backs on my board that I thought about, but I mean, if you're going to go bold, go ahead and get the jump on the position that we all thought was fixed this year and then all of a sudden it wasn't fixed. Travis Kelsey was still one of the best tight ends in the league. I think he was number two behind Mark Andrews when it was all said and done. And that offense is solid. So he's going to still be in the second round. I don't know how far down the second round. Maybe there's some drafts will be drafted in the first round still. You don't know, but he's still the number one tight end off the board, in my opinion. Yeah, I still think he's the number one tight end. That's not who I was trying to push you, push you towards okay. by any means. I thought we'd go bold with, you know, another running back that's, dynamic but often injured um which i'm not gonna take i'm not gonna take here this is so tough for me we're now we're into that point because if i'm looking at my my rankings now we've taken you know one more running back than wide receiver because of the tight end but we're pretty 50 50 on what we're doing but there's so many running backs in this next tier that Mm -hmm. like my next guy on my list is deandre swift but then like 10 people down is saquon barkley so it's like how much of a difference am I really looking at right here? And I, yeah. I do think there is one big name wide receiver that hasn't won't get talked about um, to pair with Justin Jefferson, which I think will be a lot of fun. It'd be fun rooting for, and Ooh. I'm going to do it. I'm, you know, maybe it's because I won the championship on the no running back strategy and I like it here, but for <laughs> team seven, I'm going to add AJ Brown to Justin Jefferson, the top guy in Tennessee, and we're just going to go out there and hope to pick up, you know, some running backs in the third, fourth, and fifth round that are suitable enough to carry us to a championship. 
And honestly, like you said, it does make sense because this next running back tier is so deep. Like at the beginning, we were kind of nitpicking like, oh, there's two running backs at the top and there's one wide receiver. And then the next tier is two wide receivers and two and two running backs. Like now I feel like you open it up and yeah, the difference between what is it? RB like eight and RB 15 are not that far apart. They have a lot of the same storylines of maybe they're guys that have done it before and have been injured and have been underperforming lately. Or maybe it's somebody who's on the rise, but has a lot of question marks. Like that's exactly where we're at right now. Um, But with that being said, I almost feel like that kind of like that kind of finished that next tier of wide receivers for me. So I'd probably going to dip into one of those running backs. Now, when we're looking at team six to pair with Devontae Adams, because I don't think there's the quite as dynamic wide receiver two to go here. I probably would have taken AJ Brown if you didn't, but here I'm going to go with probably Nick Chubb. Give me Nick Chubb. All right, Nick Nick Chubb to pair up with Devontae Adams. To, you know, great pick right there. Nick Chubb was like I think running back five or six in most cases last year, so falling all the way mm-hmm. to the second round, pick 18, that's pretty good um, value there. Again, you know, a little bit of a down season, but he proved he could be a you know a promising running back. But I'm with you. There's just so many running backs here that like I can make a case for. Um, Mm -hmm. So especially now that I'm on the clock for team five and we did take Najee Harris in the first round, I kind of don't want to double up here because I know I can get a solid one in round three. With that said, which wide receiver do I want to take? Because I feel like we did dip a little bit there. Do I want to go even Snyder or, you know, even more bold and add another tight end? I still think it's a little bit too early for a second tight end at this point. Um, so I'm going to go with a guy that finished as a top, you know, a wide receiver one last season. It's going to, again, it's feels a little high. We don't know who his running mate is going to be. Will Mike Williams be back? So obviously I'm talking about Keenan Allen. Um, and as of right now, I think it'll be hard for them to bring, you know, they have a ton of cat space. So maybe they will bring Mike Williams back. I know there's been some whispers of possibly Devonte if he hits the market there because he loves playing with Keenan Allen. If Devonte goes there, I think Keenan Allen's drops um, a lot. You know, Keenan Allen, again, this is another safe pick. I think with Harris and Allen, we're going very safe for the board. We're giving what the board is taking us. We're not making any bold yeah. chances. Yeah. Um. So I don't hate the draft strategy here for team five. It's, it's just very safe. We're giving, it's almost best player available. The guy at the top of your board, you're just going with the flow. Yeah, exactly. And he was the next wide receiver on my board. I just didn't know if I could take him over some of the running backs, even though I get it. There's not a big disparity between running backs in this section of the draft. I just didn't know if I could take Keenan Allen quite that early for my liking. He probably would have fell another three or four picks um, if it was me picking solo, but it's not a bad pick. We don't know who his running mate is going to be, but I think just that offense and how explosive it is, you're not going to have to worry about Keenan Allen being a problem for your team. He's going to be an asset. It just almost depends how much of an asset he's going to be. Going to team four, where we have Austin Eckler as our first pick, going into our next one here. (laughs) I'm, I'm still kind of sitting here on the running back position even though we did take a running back first, just because now, especially with Keenan Allen gone, I I like the wide receivers coming up next, even just a slightly less. Do I go bold with someone like DeAndre Swift who had injury problems, but we know his upside. Do we go with someone who was almost a forgotten man last year with Antonio Gibson? He kind of did give a bad taste on our mouth at some points, but we know that he can be a top back and he actually still finished ahead of Nick Chubb in fantasy points, which we didn't seem to believe. And he's someone I just took, but I think I'm going to go with somebody who we are seeing emerge in the playoffs. Give me cam acres. All right. Cam acres. He is, he would be the second running back left on my board. Number two. So I do like the pick here. Um, for me, it's a great pick. I would have probably considering with my next pick, but I, I'm not going to be bold and double up on the teammates like you did. Uh, And since team three has Cooper cup, you know, I was going to do it. This is a fun exercise, but (laughs) I'm going to go for the PPR machine with Cooper cup. And that's going to be my name, the PPR machine. 
Cooper Cup, and give me Jalen Waddle. Ooh, I like it. That is maybe a little higher than I thought, but he he deserves to be in consideration for a second round pick next year. And that might just be too rich for some people's blood. But if he falls into your third round, he could be one of the steals of the draft, I think. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I just took him over a guy like CeeDee Lamb over DeAndre Hopkins, who are on more explosive offenses. And again, we're this is a half point PPR formula. So that played into it a little bit. If it's full point PPR, I think it goes up. Um, we still don't know who their head coach is. So he could definitely, he'll be a big mover this offseason. If they would move on from Tua, bring in another guy, we could see some changes in that aspect of it too. Um, but I have Cooper Cup. So I think he's pretty safe to cover me if for you know going into next season. So why not take a home run swing at a guy that could finish top five? He might he might finish at fifteen, you know, twenty four, somewhere between there. Um, but at least I have Cooper Cup there to balance it out. That was my thought process behind it. That makes sense. That does make sense. And uh, I <laughs> I don't need to back up Jalen Waddle anymore. We all know how big of a fan I am of him, and we saw the breakout. Um. So now we're looking at team two who has Derrick Henry. You keep taking the wide receivers out for me where I'm like, maybe I'll think about this guy next. And now I just keep kind of pushing it back. Um, But I don't have a pick on this turn. And I think the turn is where I kind of like him the most. And I don't know if I like him falling past your next two picks. So I'm going to be the guy to pick the next tight end. And I'm just going to go ahead and take Mark Andrews here. I think that two to three turn, like these four picks right here, are I think about the sweet spot of where I'd want him to go. I like the Mark Andrews pick there. I'll let you know you could have got him on the turn. Come okay. back around, he would not have been uh, the next guy pick for me. Um, I'm going because I have Jonathan Taylor, and it's so long until I get back down. Now there's a lot of running backs I still like um, here. You know, there's like I mentioned, like I still have. I think 10 guys until I get to Saquon Barkley and not saying I, there's a reason he's down there that low, but that is another guy that he could win people leagues next year. Cause he'll be drafted in the, you know, third through fifth round and could potentially, mm-hmm. you know, finish as RB one because he has that. He just hasn't been healthy enough and we don't trust the giants as much um, for me. So I am going to go wide receiver here again um, <laughs> to pair with Jonathan Taylor I just think that the wide receivers are more valuable. And I am going to take a guy I just mentioned, and that is CD lamb, the top of, you know, the, the number one option for the Dallas Cowboys high powered offense. We expect coming into the next season. Oh, I was like, what are you typing? He typed compact disc land. I like that compact disc lamb, but I am on the turn starting <laughs> off our final round for this exercise in round three. Um, So, my team right now sits as Jonathan Taylor, CD Lamb, and blank. The question is, do I want to go running back or wide receiver? I do want to go wide receiver, but I still think the value – I still have DeAndre Swift higher than Cam Akers and higher than Nick Chubb on my list going into the next season as of right now. So because of the value, I am going to take DeAndre Swift. I do think I could have made a good case. I know I went on the rant about a guy like DeAndre Hopkins. Um, and I also think you can't rule out a guy like Deontay Johnson. I know we don't know who the quarterback is, but he is the top wide receiver. It doesn't look like Juju Smith's going to be back. Uh, so those were the guys I was thinking. But because of the current value for me, I'm going to go with DeAndre Swift. Okay, that makes sense. And I think Swift would have been my slam dunk next pick if you hadn't taken him there. So good job to steal him from me there. So it looks like if I wanted Andrews and Swift with that team two pick, I would have had to pick Swift and then Andrews. So got close, didn't quite get it. Um, but right now team two sitting with Derrick Henry and Mark Andrews. Like I said, I'm debating going that wide receiver and Deontay Johnson is the next wide receiver on my list, but I'm going to go away from it. And I'm going to go with Antonio Gibson. I guess I'm going to let Cody pick all the wide receivers, which is not shocking because Cody loves wide receivers, but Antonio Gibson was better than we thought by the end of the season, but he was a little bit of a frustration. I think there's going to be a little bit of a rebound there. JD McKissick was taking some work from him. He is a free agent. We don't know if he's going to come back or not, but we're going to in this, in terms of this exercise, hope he doesn't, I guess, and see if Gibson gets even more snaps. 
Wow, Gibson. I have four running backs higher than him heading into the season. So I wasn't okay. I don't even know if I would have taken him in this round, to be honest with you. Uh, hmm. but I understand the upside, the excitement behind it, why you would take again, he's another guy that, you know, showed some flashes. He just couldn't put it all together. And again, th- it's very hard this early season. We don't know who their quarterback will be. You know, will it be another year of Taylor Heineke? Will they go? I've heard that they're going to be some big interest in Deshaun Watson if he becomes available and that legal thing gets situated out. They could be, you know, another big player and a guy and some other big name quarterbacks to look out for. Will they go get a, you know, a veteran like a Marcus Mariota? Something like that. We'll have to wait and see on that situation. I think the quarterback plays a big factor into that situation, honestly. But it's my turn. Team three, I have Cooper Cup and Jalen Waddle. And now the question is, do I go full no running back strategy with this team and get <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins? That's a big question. Another guy, do I stick with the trend on this team, PPR receptions, and go get Amra St. Brown? Ooh. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, it would. But I'm not I'm not gonna do it. Okay. I don't think. I'm tilting. Oh, this is not good. <laughs> I'm Ross St. Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, or force a running back because I don't have one. I'm going to take a no, wide receiver because you don't I, like taking I got back. you. I got DeAndre Hopkins in the round in round three is kind of crazy in a 12 team draft. So De- it is. It is. So the value of DeAndre Hopkins, yes, I made the he's never consistent for my team. Team three is not me in real fantasy. Um, but Jalen Cooper Cup, Jalen Waddle, DeAndre Hopkins. Honestly, it probably should have been Hopkins and then Jalen Waddle. I should But even yet. <laughs> should have flipped those and taken Hopkins at the end of round two, but he made it back to me in round three. I took a, a swing on an upside guy. So give me DeAndre Hopkins. Full tilt ex- expression. Just change my pick on the fly. I like it. And that's what happens in most drafts. Like you can go in there with your ranking sheet. You can go in there with your draft strategy. And sometimes you have to read the draft. Sometimes you just have that gut feeling of this is what I should do right here. And now I'm on to team four who has Austin Eckler, Cam Akers. Cody just took DeAndre Hopkins out from under me. So I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson, another guy who gets a lot of targets. I get that it's a little bit more of a risk now that you don't know who the quarterback's going to be in Pittsburgh, but I feel like he has a chance to be a quarterback's best friend, whoever does end up starting there in Pittsburgh, knowing the kind of offense that they run, knowing that teams are going to have to stack the box for Najee Harris because they like him being the centerpiece of the offense. I just hope he doesn't catch the drops again that he had before. Definitely uh, playing with a little playing with uh, some luck, some rolling the dice, I guess is what I was trying to say there. But I do like the Deontay Johnson pick. And he does kind of wrap up a tier for me. Mm-hmm. I know I was talking about Amra St. Brown. He's like right on the fringe of this tier and the next tier. For me, it's hard to to know what the Lions are going to do. I mean, he was, you know, a day two pick. He wasn't, you know, like a, a guy we expect a lot of. He first on the certain, which is great. I mean, Stephon Diggs was a fifth round pick. And now he's you know, he's going to draft in the first round. So where you were drafted after you put film on tape or your stuff on tape, I guess is whatever. It doesn't really matter your draft position, but um, I am going to go back to the running backs. Is there's still four running backs that I have on my board that are just mind blowing that they're waiting this long t- to go to them. And, and there's actually three of them. And then the guy I'm going to take, because I think he's being yeah. forgotten about, but that is JK Dobbins. Nice. J.K. Yeah, Dobbins he is someone who's being forgotten about a little bit. He was taken, you know, a little. He we forget because he had that early offseason injury last year. But the running back for the Baltimore Ravens is valuable. We saw Latavius Murray; he could barely run. We saw Devonte Freeman; they still had valuable from a week to week basis. J.K. Dobbins should be fully recovered by then. Another running back you're getting late or early in round three at this point. But, you know, he pairs nicely with a Najee Harris. Again, this might be a little bit not what the board is telling you. The board might have told you to take the safe guy in Ezekiel Elliott, which, again, another guy we can't believe he's in round three. Uh, but I yeah. went safe with Najee Harris and Keenan Allen. So let's go a little bit more upside with J.K. Dobbins. And maybe this is me not liking uh, Ezekiel Elliott, but he's not even the next guy on my board either. And the next running back on my board to go with Devonte Adams and Nick Chubb is going to be David Montgomery. 
That was the next guy on my board as well. So <laughs> there you go. So David Montgomery, I'll take with pick six. He, I think he pairs well with Nick Chubb. You already have your wide receiver one right there. And he's somebody who I think people always let slide a little bit more. Like, I don't know where you're going to see someone like a Chris Carson go this year, but in the past, I feel like Chris Carson was always that guy who deserved to be drafted higher than he always was. Montgomery is starting to become that guy, in my opinion. But round three is still probably a pretty good sweet spot for him, and he could play like a second round running back. No, I, I really like the Montgomery pick here. Um, so I think that is definitely a a solid one. I, I do have him above Ezekiel Elliott as well. Um, I don't know. It's just maybe because he played hurt all season long, uh, so he, he looked a little bit slower. But he's just slowly been like on a decline. We saw Tony Pollard look like the better running back when he got his opportunities. They're still going to ride with Ezekiel. He's still going to get his carries. Uh, but I think his days of being a top fantasy running back are – are down like I compare him like a guy that's a little bit lower on my list as well who has been higher in years past is Josh Jacobs he looks good in spurts uh but he has those mm-hmm. disappointing weeks and I think that's where we're at the Zeke Elliott and I'm still hoping for more consistency out of the guys are drafting even in the third round I understand um that I know it is my pick now at team seven uh, I know I just talked about consistency <laughs> and I'm gonna take a guy that could be a little bit you know back and forth on consistency here uh, but another guy we've seen taken as early as, you know, pick six in last year's draft still had almost 800 yards and a bunch of touchdowns this past season, still on a high powered offense could be a bigger part depending on who the quarterback is, but that is running back Aaron Jones to pair him up with AJ Brown and Justin Jefferson. I get my first running back here on the board. I think that's a solid pick to have Aaron Jones be my RB one. When I have a guy like Justin Jefferson, and AJ Brown, leading in the receiver category. No. And I feel like I heard a couple of teams this year that had some success that, I mean, obviously Aaron Jones did not go in round three in this year's draft. He was probably a late round one or a round two guy. And they kind of used the hero running back strategy on him, took him either late first, early second, put a couple of wide receivers around him and they had some success. So the fact that you could slide him into the third round, I get why he did fall because you have, the AJ Dillon experience over there and you have to worry about him taking carries away from Jones. But I think especially if they don't have Rogers next year, they're going to have to lean more on the run game. There's no denying Aaron Jones talent. I think they'll be able to find a way to do enough around him to keep the pressure off of the run game. So I like him falling this far. It's just one of many guys who have fallen so far down the draft board this year. You're kind of like confused as to why they're there until you have to take they take a step back and look. And now we're on team eight with CMC and Travis Kelsey. Do I go with that next wide receiver? Do I finally be the person to take Zeke? I find it interesting. There's so many running backs here that are in kind of committees and you have to hope that they happen to get the line share of the carries, or they're just a little bit sketchy. The Ezekiel Elliott with Tony Pollard, the Aaron Jones with AJ Dillon, the Elijah Mitchell with all the other (laughs) bevy of 49ers running backs. Um, The only guy who seems to be a bell cow that's down here and I'm still not in love with is Saquon Barkley, but I'm going to go with a wide receiver here and I'm going to go with Mike Evans. Interesting. We don't know if Chris Godwin's going to be back in Tampa Bay. We don't even know who their quarterback's going to be next year. But Mike Evans has performed well with pretty much every quarterback that has been around him so far. And he could be more of a focal point in offense. There could be a lot less around him now that there's no A.J. Brown. I mean, sorry, Antonio Brown. <laughs> and there could be no Chris Godwin as well. Definitely an interesting pick. I was wondering when he was going to go with the, you know, the news of no um, Tom Brady, no Antonio Brown. Would Chris Godwin go first, expecting him to go be a number one on a team? I think it's definitely worth uh, monitoring as we go forward um, for me. Uh, but it's still a good pick. I think your teammate, CMC, Travis Kelsey, it's okay to take a little bit of risk at a running back. I mean, because basically Travis Kelsey is your wide receiver or sorry, a wide receiver, because Travis Kelsey is a wide receiver one, essentially. Um, so you got much, Mike yeah. Evans, who I believe is still yet to have less than a 1,000 yards in any season since he came into the league. So you're right. He only had Tom Brady for two years, but he's been a good wide receiver for eight. So it's not yep. not out of the question for him to still be 
a good guy. Um, the touchdowns will probably go down in the red zone, but we'll have to wait and see on how that one all plays out. Team nine is up here for their, their pick in the third round. Currently on their roster is Dalvin Cook and Stephon Diggs. Here is, you know, some big question marks. Here, I think this is like the perfect spot for a guy like Ezekiel Elliott if you want to play a little bit safer. Um, I think, you know, I'll just give you the next. I'm debating between three running backs, essentially, here. And that is, Ezekiel Elliott, do I want to play safe? And then it's a guy in the committee and Damian Harris. Uh, but we saw Ramondre Stevenson play well enough as a rookie last year. How much do you trust that? Um, and then the big question mark for me as a guy, it probably might be a little high for some people, is James Conner. And it's worth noting that both him and Chase Edmonds are free agents this year. Hmm. And I only think one of them will be back in Arizona. And I tend to think it'll be James Conner. And we saw hmm. how he looked when it was just him. I think they'll... They'll draft a guy, they'll keep Eno Benjamin, and they'll let James Conner have the reins. Granted, he'll, he'll have a lot more attempts than he did last year. Uh, the touchdown number might come down. But for me, I am going to, even though I have Ezekiel Elliott higher on my board with the team that I currently have, Dalvin Cook and Stephon Diggs, I am going to go with James Conner. It is a last-minute pivot over a guy like Ezekiel Elliott. Like I mentioned, he is higher on my board. But I am going to go in with this expectation that James Conner will be the running back with no Chase Edmonds in Arizona next year. Another high-powered offense. We see him use both in the run and pass game. And that running back in Arizona has been important for the last few years under Cliff Kingsbury. So another solid running back option to add here in round three. Interesting. I like it. Um, So now we're on to team 10. Joe Mixon and Jamar Chase. I'm going to take T. Higgins. And no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Joe Burrow. He is probably the next Bengal. It could be Joe Burrow too. Uh, it's between them two to go for well, this team because no, it's going to be the all Bengal your, team. Before you make your pick, you mentioned T Higgins, okay. and yeah. I meant to bring this up when you uh, talked about drafting Jamar Chase, but I'll do it now since you just mentioned him. Last okay. year, we all took Brandon Ayuk over, and we said the value might be in Debo Samuel. We all took Robert Woods and said the value might be in Cooper Cup. Honestly, heading into the drafts at this point, I'm not tra- chasing Jamar Chase. I think he's special. I think he's a great player. But T. Higgins is a very solid option that you might be able to get in rounds four through seven, depending on where you're drafting or who you're drafting with. That could be a top. He could have finished above Jamar Chase. So I do like the T. Higgins name. Now, obviously not taking him here. I, that was a no, joke no, for no. being the whole Bengals team. <laughs> but do think about that too when you Jamar Chase and how good T. Higgins was. He did have that spurt at the beginning of the season, but he came on strong. He was their top option for a few weeks, and then Jamar Chase became the top option in the the um, the fantasy playoffs. So that's what we remember most recently. But don't sleep on T. Higgins in the later rounds of the draft. That's true, and I don't think he's going to fall that far. He'll probably go somewhere in the next three, four rounds, I would assume. Um, but yeah. No, not actually going to take another bangle for this spot. But part of me, like, where, like, I almost wonder, like, I'm just trying to think. In our our, our League of Record draft, the end of the first round, like, that that one-two turn was Saquon Barkley and uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel Elliott. Elliott. Yes. They're both still on the board near the end of round three. I get all the question marks for him, but, like, I'm just... In my head, I'm thinking, how far do they fall before I have to say the upside is enough? Which I think this is one of the spots that I have to take the one. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, which one are you? Do you trust more? Which I guess if you're going to pick one of them, that's going to tell me who. But yeah, so I'll I'll give you a little walk through. So if you look at the amount, like the amount of carries in that offense, you lean Saquon because Saquon is pretty much a three down back. They don't like to supplement him. It seems like quite as much Zeke has Tony Pollard over his shoulder who has been healthier and more successful over the last few years. It's Zeke. So I think Mixon and Jamar chase is a solid base that I can go away from the safer pick and go to the slightly more edgy pick. And I'm going to take Saquon Barkley, hoping that he ends up staying healthy and stays being a three down back. And that could be the slam dunk. I need to turn this team where, Maybe it's sketchy having two people on the same team can turn into a championship contender. 
dude, I, I do not blame you in the, the least for taking Barkley here. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, is there too much recency bias into it? Why are these guys falling? Like they've been, you know, top picks. Even last year when they went 10-11 in our 10-team draft that you brought up, we're like, oh, that could be the steal of the draft. It, yep. I mean, they it wasn't. And maybe that's part of the reason we both played in leagues where they were already being taken in the second round, essentially. And now they're just dropping more. And there's a lot of young players and upsides. And, you know, these older guys that we've been disappointed on, it's why we call it the way too early. We're very excited about those guys. So I wouldn't be surprised if when we do this, Again, in the middle of the summer, that Barkley ends up back in round two if Zeke goes up in round two. But I'm going to take the other one. I am going to take Ezekiel Elliott here. I mean, he's higher than some other running backs on my early prediction boards than some guys. I think Zeke, you know, you know he's going to get carries. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, you know, we're talking Ezekiel Elliott and the other running backs I'm looking at are Leonard Fournette, uh, Miles Sanders. Those guys. For now, we don't know what team he's going to play on. Miles Sanders didn't have a touchdown all season, and it's got to change. It's got to right. But then, but they, the Eagles always have four running backs, and it's always like, yes, what what are you going to do there? So I do like Ezekiel Elliott. Again, I have Debo Samuel, Javante Williams. Zeke seems a little bit safer. He could be like the. I took some big swings early, trying to balance out my team a little bit in that way. Uh, but again, Zeke in round three. Seems like a huge pick, but I also know I'm taking him in round three because he could bust. Exactly. And I don't know, like, because when we got this far down, it seems like everybody we're picking is in a good spot. And then I get to Zeke and Barkley and it's like, uh, should they be this low? And like you said, it probably will adjust out to the me- the middle a little bit as we move through the summer. Like this is probably the overreaction. Maybe you don't take james connor that high but i do love the fact that you put the name james connor out there because you know he could be a big guy maybe deandre swift falls a little bit further and antonio gibson as well because we are pumping the brakes a little bit more we're not being quite as optimistic and then maybe zeke and barkley do slide back up towards that second round like but i just feel like they had to at least be included in this list because them falling out of the third round seemed a little bit ridiculous but I but was kind of hoping you let point Zeke too. fall to me. <laughs> what was that? I mean, I could see it too. Like if Zeke and Barkley fall out of the top three rounds, you know, it'll be like, to me, I'm honestly evaluating them like I would a Chris Carson. Now, granted, he has a neck injury mm. that, you know, he's in a different situation. But the last few years, Chris Carson was a guy that you knew was going to get carries. You knew he'd have a couple good games, but you didn't want on your fantasy team. And unfortunately, that's where I'm at with Ezekiel Elliott and Chris and what it, Saquon Barkley like yeah. their guy like you know what you're getting like they don't feel they're not fun picks you don't expect them to win your league you don't expect them to you know be the oh I got gotcha. you maybe in round four you start to feel that way again about them but I think that's why they're falling at this point yeah exactly um but I was kind of hoping you'd let Zeke fall to me because I would have taken him, I think, at that at, with Team 12 here who has Tyreek Hill and Alvin Kamara so far. I will um, I, Because, go ahead. I was going to say, I will say, if you need to think about it, I'll, I stole your pick. A guy that would be in consideration here, and maybe I'm stealing your thunder, would be Josh Allen. I feel like he will be the first quarterback off the draft, but I'm a big proponent to not drafting quarterbacks high, which is why I didn't. Um, but I can make the case for Josh Allen being the top quarterback taken at the end of round three. Uh, so he was in consideration too, but again, I'm a, there's a lot of decent quarterbacks, good quarterbacks. I mean, even on my current list, like Jalen hurts is currently quarterback seven and we saw him be a top five quarterback, Matt Stafford. Mm-hmm. He, you can get late in the rounds and he'll be the value for quarterbacks often is, you know, the top quarterback and the 12th quarterback. It's a narrow margin. So that's why I went with a, another running back here, but I do want to give Josh Allen a shout out. No, I agree with you there too. I probably wouldn't take him in the third round. The earliest I ever want to take a quarterback is round three. I see plenty of times where he goes in round one and two in drafts and I'm just ripping my hair out. Um, But I still like normally it would be like if Patrick Mahomes was the top quarterback in these last few years, I wouldn't even think about touching him unless he fell into round four. And that's probably where I'd be at with Josh Allen here. The earliest I would take him is on this turn. If I felt really confident with my team and thought Josh Allen could give me that little bit of an edge of the position. 
but I'm not even quite convinced on that. Um, so don't worry. I'm glad you mentioned it. That is not stealing my thunder. Well, I think I you, go ahead. Mahomes, I'll just say for you, Mahomes might even make more sense. Again, you're probably not taking him here, but the combo because with Tyreek Hill, with Tyree yeah. Hill would probably make more sense. But again, this is why we're not taking a quarterback so high because you have Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson. Why, why race to get one of those guys that'll probably finish, you know, at most 40 points from the number one to number six on that group. Like that's what we're, that's what we're saying with the quarterback strategy. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but you're right. Mahomes would kind of make sense because of the Tyree kill stack, but earliest I would take him is in that fourth round of this turn. Probably want to wait until the five, six turn. If I was trying to stack him with Hill and he's probably not falling that far, which is fine. Um, I'm going to try to pair a running back with Kamara because I think he is a much more sketchy candidate than Tyree Kill. I'm going to go with like the hero wide receiver strategy. I don't know if that's the thing, but I'm confident my wide receivers are Tyree Kill. Avin Kamara, I'm going to pair with a running back and I'm between Leonard Fournette, which is an interesting situation. He's a free agent as well. If he's going to stay in Tampa Bay, if Tampa Bay is going to be quite as potent without Tom Brady, Elijah Mitchell, who we already talked about the San Francisco backfield. And Josh Jacobs, who's another name we've mentioned so far, but we don't know exactly how he's going to be because he's such an up and down back. Um, I'm going to probably go with the upside here, thinking that he has kind of earned that number one job to go along Debo Samuel. That's Elijah Mitchell. I think he deserves some love. His name deserves to be in the conversation in this part of the draft. And I think it's going to shake out throughout the offseason once we see how they you know, prepare their running back room in the off season as to where he's exactly going to fall. But if it falls the way I think it is with, they're going to have Raheem Mostert out. And I still don't think that they love Trey Sermon as much as they wish they would have. It should be Elijah Mitchell's job first paired with Debo, which we showed that Mitchell can still be a very successful fantasy running back, even with Debo taking carries from him. I like it. I think that's a good place to wrap up our three rounds. I do like the Elijah Mitchell, uh, but since we're talking San Francisco running backs, I do want to go back to Debo Samuel real quick. I know the show is going on forever, so we thank you for <laughs> uh, hanging in there with us. But Debo Samuel, if he comes out next year with running back and wide receiver eligibility, how, does that move him up at your list at all? Because he's um, two spots. I... So move him up from where we have him at 11. Let's just say he's he's at 11 if he just has wide receiver strategy or wide receiver eligibility. If you split him wide receiver running back, he could jump above a Joe Mixon or a, or a Dalvin Cook. I could put him up to like eighth, ninth on my list. I would say a small jump, but I think he's already valued so high. And we are valuing wide receivers almost as high as running backs at this point that I feel like it's not a dramatic change. I don't think it moves them up to the top tier of running backs or anything like that, but you could see a small jump there. I, I would, yeah, I think he would actually jump up pretty high for me just because, you know, then you could still get your running, your wide receivers that you like and play them in the running back slot. But again, I don't foresee that happening except maybe on Yahoo because they're the ones that like to do that the most. Um, mm-hmm. But I think on your, your sleeper app, your NFL hashtag, not a sponsor. Maybe ESPN. I don't think any of them are going to be switching Debo Samuel anytime soon. But that is our three-round mock draft. It was a lot of fun. It is definitely going to look a lot different. Um, but it's Pro Bowl week. Not a lot of people pay attention to that. But hope. I mean, unless you're going to watch the coach on the sideline, because you got to check out Matt Lafleur and Mike Rabel, the two coaches that should have been. You thought I was making a "Who's the hottest coach?" joke. I was. I kind of you were. I was. I'm not going to lie. I can't even hide behind <laughs> it. But the two coaches that should have been in the Super Bowl. Uh, they're coaching this weekend. Uh, but as always, thanks for listening to this episode of the Couch GM's podcast. Remember to get involved. It's more fun for us and more fun for you when you get involved. So let us know. Do you like this mock draft? Which guys are you like? I can't believe they've fallen. I can't believe they're still available. What were you thinking? Let us know. We'd love to hear it. But as always, thanks for listening. Yes. Thank you one more time for listening into the Couch GM's podcast. Make sure you're tuning in with us next week. We break down the big game, Super Bowl, and we give you a playoff challenge update. We can see who is in striking distance to get that win. Come join us on the show here post-Super Bowl. You won't want to miss it. Thank you guys one more time for listening in. For Cody Roadcap, I'm George Kirk, and we'll see you all next week.